We'll, we'll keep it easy. Hi, this is Julia Whittup with Talk Story Media. Hi, Doug. That Doug Vindemir. Vermeer. <laughs> we talked about this. Anyway, we talked about this. No, it's, it's no problem, but yeah, we'll get it. Vermeer, Vermeer, Vermeer. We'll dig it in there. We'll get it. Okay. No problem. Now, can you imagine, though, when I was like in the first grade? You're having uh, trouble now. I, I have trouble then, big time. So I get it. I get it. That's hilarious. I bet you did. My maiden name was Hubbard, so I was old lady Hubbard from the time I was six. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's funny. That is a good laugh. So Doug is a movie maker. Tell us more about the movies. Yeah, well, I guess um, here's the funny thing is, is just like you as a young kid, I actually started in movies as a young kid when I was in like the second grade. My mom got me involved in doing some uh, background extra work because it was a lady that she worked with uh, who her son was doing that. And he had made quite a bit of money to pay for his college when he got older and stuff. So my, my mom wanted to get me involved in that. So I did that, but uh, I never really became famous. I never became an A-list or anything <laughs> like that, right? But um, when I got into college, I continued to do school um, with film and stuff. I took courses on film. And uh, at that point, uh, I really started kind of getting involved a little bit with personal development. I started interviewing some of the world's top achievers, kind of what Napoleon Hill did. In fact, the media calls me the modern day Napoleon Hill. So I got some of the biggest names in the world for, you know, uh, business leadership, entrepreneurships, uh, celebrities, athletes, people who have done some amazing things. And for me, kind of what happened is, is I didn't really know how to present that but then I was like, oh yeah, you're involved in film. Make Why don't you film. just make a film? <laughs> and so this, is, this gets really funny because my first efforts at doing a film, uh, I had people tell me, no, nobody wants to see a film like that. Either make a how-to fitness kind of video, that we get, or a documentary straight up, that we get. But this idea of teaching in a film, and now we don't get that. But then all of a sudden, the movies, What the Bleep, and The uh -huh. Secret, and things like that came along. And so and then people came back and they were knocking on my door. They said, okay, there is an audience for this. I think maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, we could do something with this. And so I went back uh, and, and did my first movie in 2008 called The Opus. And for those of you who might know, The Opus is an Italian word, which means the work. And so here everyone was talking about the law of attraction. I decided to go the opposite direction and talk about the work that needs to be done. And, um, and there is work that needs to be done. And so in that film, I brought people like Jack Canfield, who you'd seen in The Secret, Mark Victor Hansen, who was the other part of Chicken Soup for the Soul, and others like Joe Vitale and John T. Martini and Marcy Shymoff and all the gang that had been in The Secret, as well as several of the other top achievers I'd interviewed. And the film was a hit. In fact, Random House picked it up. They did 23 languages worldwide with the book. Wow. Which was just awesome. Yeah. And then, so I loved doing it so much that uh, right away these guys asked me, they said, when's your next movie? And I hadn't even thought that far. And so I started thinking about what I would do for the next movie. And as I was thinking about the success interviews that I actually had done with the top achievers, it was something that all the success people practiced, but it wasn't in any of the books. Like no one was writing about it at the time. And that was gratitude. They all practiced some form of gratitude. So my second movie was called The Gratitude Experiment. And I brought in that one people like Bob Proctor and Mary Morrissey. We had John Gray, who did Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, uh, Marie Diamond from The Secret, and a handful of others. In fact, John Demartini was back. In fact, John Demartini has been in all of my movies so far. He's one of my best friends, so I, I include him in all of them. Uh, but in that film, we explored how gratitude can change things. And isn't it interesting that even that message is very profound and powerful for right now, like what's going on with not only the riots, but the COVID and all, like, uh, I think there's a real lack of gratitude that has us kind of fighting against each other and ourselves even right now, but more on that at another time. Uh, but that was our second movie. And then uh, we enjoyed making the movie so much that we did a third one conversation that a lot of people seem to really want to talk about is money because <laughs> yeah. we need it right money is important yeah, right so. it's kind of like what zig ziglar said some people think money isn't important but it really ranks up there with oxygen <laughs> you need it right and so um yeah so having interviewed 400 of the world's top achievers people who made multi-billion with a b dollars not just people who you know kind of scraping by and stuck in the rat race um there were a lot of principles i learned through those interviews that i felt needed to be shared in a film so the treasure map, in my opinion, is the best money film that's out there because it doesn't just focus on the mindset and some, you know, kind of 
way out there strategies that everyone can nod their head and say, well, that makes sense, but I don't know what to do with it. This is actually real practical stuff that you can do. So stuff that, like a map of how to get there. A map, there. yeah, and, and even how to evaluate the opportunities that come your way. Uh, for me, when I first started interviewing the top achievers, I was a broke kid. My dad worked in construction. My mom babysat kids in the home. I wore hand-me-downs even up until high school. But as soon as I started implementing these strategies that I learned from the 400 of the world's top achievers, my life changed. And in about six months, I did $1.6 million. That's about $9,000 a day wow. for those of you doing the arithmetic on that. Um, so these principles work. And the cool thing is they work for anybody, even a 19-year-old kid that was raised in a poverty pattern. So that was our, our third movie. But now our newest one, which is really exciting, is How Thoughts Become wow. Things. That's the banner behind us. Yeah, um, this one's probably my favorite. And I know that's, you know, you're probably just saying that because it's the most recent one. Maybe that's true. Um, people often ask me, what's your favorite movie that you've ever made? And it's generally my answer Always is the, the, most the next one <laughs> or, or the next one. Every time, yeah. right? so. That's true. That's true. But one of the reasons I really love this film that I think is, is very timely for right now, especially with what's going on in the world with the COVID and all these things, a lot of people are in kind of a state of fear and a lot of, you know, discouragement and doubt and their thoughts are really kind of, um, robbing them from their greatest possibilities. And the one thing that I noticed from the beginning as I interviewed these 400 of the world's top achievers is that they, they had a different way of thinking about things. They had a different way of looking at things. And maybe a really fundamental idea in this is that um, oftentimes we allow our, our external situations to have an impression upon us. In fact, that word impress, impression is a really important word because we do become like the five people we spend the most time with. But the problem is, is we, we arrive with our programming already, right? So whether we got that from our family or uh, even our family before our family, like their mm -hmm, parents and grandparents, right. there were things that arrived then. But when we arrive, there's things that we accept as truth that maybe are not going to really empower us or give us the strength we need. And so it's, you know, I think it's a really timely film for us to be able to examine and to become more aware of what is it that we're programmed to believe. And then we have some choices. What do we really want to believe that's going to serve us best? And the thoughts that we generally focus the most energy on are the ones that are going to turn into a reality. And the interesting thing that we also discovered in the film, which was kind of fun, is that any time a powerful, inspiring thought comes, right? You get this really neat, unique, inspiring idea of something you want to do or something you want to be or something you want to have or right behind it come these negative ideas. They're always coming in pairs, right? They never come by themselves. So the minute that a, a really wow idea comes, comes this self-defeating idea of fear, you're not good enough, self-worthiness isn't there, you don't have what it takes, you don't have the connections, you don't have the money or the resources. So we've got to understand how can we stabilize around these thoughts that are empowering, mm -hmm. but then also help them to gain momentum so that it's not just a matter of having a good thought, it's a matter of activating the good thought so that it begins to roll out into actionable steps or things that will provide an insight that will allow you to get to the next part of that unfolding it's it's almost like a, a seed or a flower that unfolds if yeah. we stop it here it never has the ability to expand but if we allow it to flower and fold soon it becomes strong enough and just like a tree pretty soon it doesn't really matter what the outside forces say about it you've got so much momentum that you can't be stopped right? It's now a strong rooted tree rather than just simply a, a small withering kind of questionable you mm -hmm. know, spring, a sprig, I think is what they call it. Yeah. So that's, that's my movie making career, a seedling, right? And so that's, that's kind of the mission. That's what we want to share. We want people to be able to really tap into their best self. So that's the tools we're trying to share. So did you learn to run all the lights and cameras and all of that no. stuff? <laughs> no. no? <laughs> I, I've taken courses and training on that. But you know what? Let's, let's cheat a little bit here, right? Um, when, I was being, uh, when I was involved in the interviews with the top 400 achievers, they told me, avoid selfish questions. You know, in fact, one of the mentors I specifically remember said, says, if you want to become rich, successful, and wealthy, and have all the things that your heart desires, avoid selfish questions. It's like, okay, well, what How does do that mean? That's a selfish question, yeah. Exactly, that's what I thought. Well, selfish questions generally always include the word I, and they often start with how and what, coupled with the, the word I. So let's use an example. How can I do that? Uh -huh. you know? How okay. should I do that? You know, uh -huh. what, what can I do to make that happen? What are the things on my checklist that I need to do? Well, those always involve me. 
right? Yeah, right. <laughs> and so what this one mentor said to me, which I thought was brilliant, he said, you just shift two words always in your questions and you'll always add the word who and add the word you, okay? So the question is, who do you know <laughs> who can help you? <laughs> who do you have that you can delegate it? Who do you uh, know that can systematize this, right? Who can do this better than you, right? right. And so this is always how I've, I've approached everything, whether it's building finances in my life or building the movies, right? The only things that you really can't delegate, I say, is you can't delegate doing your own push-ups. You can't delegate your haircut. And you certainly can't delegate taking care of your spouse and kids. You need to be there for those things. But everything else can be delegated, right? right. And so one of the smartest things that I did in our first film, The Opus, um, I had gone to film school. I had done all that. But I still had never produced a major, big Hollywood-style production. I, I'd still never done that on my own. And so one of the first things that I did is I hired the cameraman, a friend of mine who had done Brokeback Mountain, Shanghai Noon, Shanghai oh, Nights, wow. Good Luck Chuck, uh, all, all these movies he'd done. And then what I did, okay, so Renee, if you're watching, now you know the secret. But huh. what would happen is I'd let him set up the shot. I told him what I needed. I shared, shared with him a few ideas around storyboards. I let him set up the shot. Then I came there and he said, you know, Mr. Vermeer, what do you think of this? And you don't have to call me Mr. We're friends by now, right? Okay. So I said, you can call me Doug, but what do I think of this? I said, okay, so why do we put the light there? Why do we put this there? Why do we like this frame? And he'd explain. So in other words, he became my film school. He taught me, right? Oh, yeah. And then just at the end, I'd say, okay, yep, I like it. Let's go. Let's roll with that. <laughs> right? And, <laughs> and you could have so, said that in the first place. Okay. I could have, <laughs> but I wanted to learn. And, and to be honest with you, I, I won't lie to you. There were times that I kind of, you know, I, I looked at it. I tried to seem like I was smart and say, well, what if we put the light here? And I'd move the mic or the light up thing there. And then he'd go, well, you know, it's this. And I go, okay, yeah, yeah, I see. Well, let's put this kind back block in the was. person's face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily blocking their face, but, you know, I would, I would do a few adjustments to at least add my input. And make, make it, it seem like, like, I, like I had a reason for being there, right? I have a reason for being here, I promise. Um, but here's the deal is now we are four movies later. There's obviously a lot more confidence that I have, more things that I understand and that I know. And we have, to some degree, built kind of a, a how, how do we call this, a system for us to be able to come in and be effective. So I kind of know ahead of time now what I'm looking for. In fact, I don't mind saying this, it's kind of embarrassing, but in the first movie that I made, um, The Opus, I made one mistake, one mistake, and it cost me $50,000 <gasps> later oh. yeah, in, in post-production right? So, you know, sometimes our mistakes can cost us a lot and we try to learn from them. Um, don't be afraid to make them, but um, it gets easier as we understand. It's kind of like, you know, it's funny. I was talking to one of my um, top achievers that I interviewed once and he's really uh, made a fortune in investing on the stock market. And he said to me this once, he said, because I asked him, I said, how risky is it to invest in the stock market? And he said, well, for someone who doesn't know anything, it's pretty risky for sure. Yeah. And he said, but the more that we learn, the, the word actually isn't risk that we use anymore. The word is evaluation. You see, as we gain the education and the understanding of what to look for, we don't really put ourselves in risky circumstances. We know the right questions to ask, the things to look for, the things that will work and the things that don't. We kind of almost instinctively, it's almost like that word by, or book by Malcolm Gladwell, Blink if you've heard of that book before, where you can almost look at something and you don't even have to examine it. You just kind of have that gut instinct that something's either going to work or it's not. It's right or it's not, right? And so, you know, I mean, you know, if, if you've got a specific set of talents or skills that you've developed over a lifetime, you generally have an advantage over someone else who's coming in as a novice, right? Mm -hmm. you, you can spot right away where the, where the potential challenges might be, where the errors might be. And so I think for me, my first film, even though I'd gone to film school, I still didn't yet have the experience to be able to do that. But now, again, three movies later, I do. Yeah. And um, yeah, and, and we've been very fortunate because this movie, it's, it's, it's very powerful. Like I said, we've got some of the biggest names and thought leadership that we've been able to capture some of their very best teachings. And um, also uh, not just capture the teachings, but now package it in a way that the audience who's tuning into it gets so much value out of it that they can
can apply some of these tools in a way that they've never heard before and they can get results that they've never experienced before. Because for me, like people often ask, well, what's it like to have Bob Proctor in your film or Joe Vitale or these guys? And it's wonderful. They're amazing people, but it really doesn't do anybody any good unless they can learn from them. Right. Right. So we need to be able to unfold that in and such a way that they're going to get it. And, and so that's really the mission in the film is how do we give people a new experience, but also unlock a level of power within themselves? Because the movie isn't just an experience where we want you to just watch. The movie is an experience where we want you to change. We want yourself. you to experience it. That's right. Yeah. And, and I think we've accomplished that with this film. In fact, the reviews right now are literally off the hook. It's crazy how people are enjoying this. It's, uh, cool. I've, never, I've never seen this level of response or success before. Wonderful, wonderful. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It's well, pretty neat. Pretty neat. And what's, do you want to say it out loud on the, the interview where your website is, please? Oh, yeah, for sure. People can actually download the movie right now at howthoughtsbecomethings.com. So www.howthoughtsbecomethings.com. And for those that head there, we've actually got kind of some neat bonuses right now for those that come and watch the film. So in other words, there's a, uh, a workbook that's now available to you that allows you to apply the material even outside of the context of the film to bring it right into your daily life. There's some audios that are there. There's some uh, daily quote books and reminders and things up there. And it's all free when, when you watch the movie. So um, just some great tools. We want people to, to learn, grow, and literally have it change their life. Great. And what, where are some of the places you're going to premiere? <laughs> well, right now, obviously, with the way that COVID is going, um, we're not able to show the movie uh, in the theaters as we normally do. But we will be doing that in the future. Right now, what we're doing is we're um, screening it primarily online. And then we've got different groups that are setting up watch parties. So together, they're watching it as a group. And by the way, if a person assembles a watch party and has up to 25 people in it, we'll bring one of the speakers on to do a Zoom call with all of your attendees at the end, which is really, really quite fun. Because yes. I have, I had a shaman's camp scheduled. I had a shaman's camp last year. And I had one scheduled for this year, it's still scheduled for August 21st through 23rd. I don't know yeah. if we're going to be able to have it. So I'm trying to back up with a lot of video stuff. Maybe I could do a watch party. We'd love, we'd love to do one. And it, it's very easy. So there's a few ways that we can do it. We are, I've got a really great technology team. They can set up even a specific landing page for your guests to come in. And there's a countdown and they can all watch it together at once. Or you guys can watch it on your own and we will come in on the separate Zoom link and talk about it. And um, most of the speakers from the film have been very available for all of those. It's kind of booked on a first come basis, right? Okay. But, um, you know, any of those speakers that would be really good for your specific group, um, we'd love to help you support that. And it, it's a great, like, here, here's the thing with these films that I think is, is important. And with the work that you do to be able to bring it in. Uh, the bottom line is, is the movie is designed to be the beginning of a conversation, to give you some tools, to get you thinking about it and started and working on it. But if they can bring in people like yourself to then help them finish the work or be accountable for the work that they've learned or give them support when they run up against that, remember those two kinds of thoughts yes, that are there, right? So, yeah. There. Yeah, so we, we want to help people and obviously having people like yourself as part of our team or other life coaches or business coaches or business individuals or people who are familiar with this work, that's really useful because we're all really here to help each other. That's the mission, right? right? And so again, how thoughts become things. This is, you know, an, uh, like I said, really just the beginning of a conversation to give you some tools to say, okay, what can I do with this now? Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's um, wrap up this interview and work out the details for this later. And I just want to tell the viewers who are watching this that they should plan on plan on seeing the movie at. Well, they can see it earlier, but plan on seeing the movie and participating in the discussion at Shaman's Camp, August twenty first through twenty third. Love to do it. Sounds like fun. Okay.